Hi everyone, this is Grandmaster Eugene Perlstein and together with ChessLecture.com I'd like to welcome you to today's video. Now today I want to revisit one of the lesser known world champions, Vasily Smyslov. And Smyslov is sort of overshadowed by the great Botvinnik who he has played a match. Actually, he played against Botvinnik three matches, right guys? This is almost like Karpov Kasparov station, where in the first match, it was tied and Botvinnik retained his title. In the second match, Smyslov finally won. And in the third match, Botvinnik made a comeback and beat Smyslov. So that was an epic fight. And the other player that he has overshadowed is the world champion that came after him, Mikhail Tal, who is extremely famous for his attack in chess. Yet, as you guys will see in this game, Smyslov is just as talented in attack as Tal. It just so happened that probably throughout his career, he decided to take a more uh, maybe sane approach, more positional approach. But when he was younger, he was attacking like a beast, given the opportunity. So in this game from 1951, this is the semifinals of the USSR championships. His opponent is trying to confuse Smyslov by playing D6. So normally if you're a D4 player and somebody answers with D6, you have a dilemma. Do you play E4 and transpose to something like a perk? Do you play C4 and allow this very nice E5 idea? For example, c4, e5. This is actually pretty much close to equality, this endgame. Well known. Or do you play knight f3, which allows possible bishop g4 ideas in the future? So this is what Smyslov was debating and his attitude for this game. I will take the center and I will go for the kill. So e4. So we enter a very sharp bishop g5 line of the perk. The idea is quite simple. Queen d2, castle, f4, e5, and ram through black's position. I'm actually surprised that bishop g5 is not as popular these days given how ambitious the system for white is. So you may want to take this idea and add it to your repertoire in case you know somebody who likes to play the perk. Bishop g7, Queen d2, and here black could castle and allow white his idea with castle long f4, e5, or what he did in the game is also quite logical, simply go after the bishop. Bishop f4, g5, bishop g3, knight h5. This is well-known idea. You put the pawns on a slightly weakened squares, but there's a bishop there protecting the king side, and you're gonna go for the bishop on g3. Well-known for many openings, such as the Tory, the London system, except in this specific case, white has full control of the center. So Smyslov decides to continue with his attack. Knight c6, pitting the knight, bishop d7, knight g2, white's mob mobilizing all his forces, and black says, all right, I'm gonna take, and obviously you wanna take with the h pawn, not the f pawn, you wanna have the open half rather the half open file and the option of playing f4, e5. And black says, give me your bishops. Give me your bishops. Smyslov obviously doesn't want to play bishop a4. He's only help helping his opponent's attack against the king with b5, another tempo move. So he says, yes, I will give you the bishop pair. And this is the position both players were striving for. So let us pause for a moment and try to evaluate. Generally speaking, right, two bishops are more than a knight. As a matter of fact, half a pawn more than a knight. So why on earth would Smyslov, who is extremely sound positional player, do this? Good question, right guys? And the answer is the following. Look at the kings. White's king is safely tucked away. The rooks are connected. Black is two moves from castling queenside. He probably doesn't want to castle kingside with the 
h file like this. He needs two moves. Well, one, two, but that's not even enough. He may probably want to play e6, queen, e7, and then castle, because with the queen on d7, moves like d5 make, make that bishop quite uncomfortable. So that tells us a pretty simple answer. We have to go for the kill as well. There is no need to waste tempi like king b1 or a3 or rook bringing the rook in. All of these moves are too slow, guys. Rapid attack going after the king. f4, x clan. And Smyslov, who is pretty much grew up in the Soviet Union, coached by, you know, top Russian oh, back then masters, he understood initiative above all when you have a big edge in development. Okay, Black plays his plan, e6. He wants to go queen e7, possibly castle long. Again, you give Black two moves, the bishops may eventually outplay the knights in the long game. But here, Smyslov goes on the offensive. d5, not a difficult move to predict. Black doesn't want to open up the game. He plays bishop back. And I should also point out that after pawn takes, Probably black's idea, or rather white's idea, was to take with the knight. That knight is quite annoying, and then this friend can support him in the center. So these are the ideas that Smyslov had. So there's no need to take. Black retreats. And again, queen e7, followed by castle, and black is slightly cramped, but doing quite well. So here's a question for you guys. Imagine you are Vasily Smyslov, former world champ. What are you going to do? Well, if you said blow open the opponent king, you're on the right track. How are we going to do that? Slightly difficult. We have so many options. Well, we can kind of rule out f5 because he's simply, you're not really going to do much. He can lock things up if he wants to, right? You can take, you can play e5. And Smyslov decides to take first. Pawn takes, and now I really love his next move. So if you thought about taking, taking, and doing the next move, you definitely are a strong attacking player. And here Smyslov takes a page from Mikhail Tal's book and says, Material, who cares? Irrelevant. E5, X clan. Notice what he's doing. He's blowing open the entire board. Black says, okay, prove it. Prove it to me that you can do this. I should also point out that d5, which is a natural way to try to lock up the game, runs into very serious pawn sack, another pawn sack, f5. And after bishop takes e5, knight d4, and with the rook coming in, you know, either rook, this king is pretty much dead in the middle of the board. So Black didn't want to do that for obvious reasons. So he says, I'm just going to take. And now, here comes the critical idea. Why doesn't want to take back on e5? He goes after the weakened king with a quiet move, queen d3. And the devastating check cannot easily be stopped. Notice the king can't come in because the bishop is hit, and the queen can't come in. Again, the bishop is hit. So queen e7 is the defensive try. Now check. Again, you can't block with the queen because they can trade and take the bishop. And black simply plays king d8. King f8 walking into the f-file from the h1 rook is suicidal. So he's hoping to play king here, bishop here or there. And maybe do what is called castle by hand or manual castle. Just get the king into safety. Once again, guys, time matters. Time matters and it's not obvious how to get your pieces in the game. So the next question is once again, imagine you're the great Smyslov, or maybe if you were Mikhail Tal, for somebody who you can relate to maybe a little bit with more familiarity, how can you attack the enemy king? And if you said just double the rooks in the d-file, it's game over, you're being a little too simplistic. Now, if rook d2, king c8, you double, the bishop can now move to c6 or e8. Your attack comes to that end. You need to get your knights involved, guys. 
But the problem is knight e4, there is really no follow-up. This knight kind of stuck on e2. So this position requires more sacrifices, of course. f5, exclam, yet again. Unbelievable chess by Vasily Smyslov. Pawn takes, it looks as though black is dominating with these central pawns. Knight d5 though, tempo move with the queen. Queen f8. And now the star move of the game. Once I saw this move, I said to myself, Smyslov is no worse than Tal. He really has a good feel for dynamics. So again, there is no direct way to win the game. We need to get more pieces in the game. Doubling the rooks is a logical idea, but once again, king c8, and he slowly will run away. So the hint I'm going to give you guys is you want to get this rook into the game, but in a very unusual way, in a such a way that when the king is on c8, you can still cause damage. Okay, so why don't you take a moment and figure this out? And another hint is the position calls for more sacrifices. That's right, more sacrifices are in order. And the move is g4 double x clan. What another pawn sacrifice and a really unusual one because the rook actually wants to enter the game via h3 square where it can do this, right? Put pressure or c3 and put pressure there. And now the whole strategy makes sense. And this is what I mean when I talk about attacking the uncastled king. Your opponent's rooks are so terrible that the fact that you're sacrificing pawns to open up files is actually only helping you. Okay, so what is he gonna play? What is black gonna play? Black plays a5, a very creative idea to get his own rook involved. I really like that move. But before we start looking at that move, first of all, let me mention that after pawn takes, this is pretty much game over, right? The rook is coming through and there is simply no defense. Okay, that's one possible line. Another possible line is f4, rook h3. Again, this pawn you can take, but you're walking into a very annoying discovered check, and then the rook can swing over to either d3 or c3. Looks pretty bad, right guys? He can try it, but it's not really giving me a lot of confidence. And now, let's look at what he did in the game. Very creative move, I should say. And here Smyslov takes the pawn, which is not a bad move, but it does lose a pretty serious chunk of his attack. When I analyze this game with modern engines, they point a very interesting sequence, starting with the move knight b6. After pawn takes, queen e6 hitting the bishop, the sequence is rather forced. Queen e7, rook takes, queen takes, rook d1, black has to give up the queen. And at first it looks like two rooks and a bunch of pawns, right? Especially these guys, is more than enough for the queen. But if you look at this position closely, you realize that, well, this king is quite open. The knight could come in re rather quickly and these pawns are pretty weak. Therefore, the computer will say white is close to winning. But for a human, it's not obvious, not obvious at all. So Smyslov, what he does also makes sense, but it does give black some hope. Pawn takes, here comes the rook, f6, logical idea to get the queen back in the game. Rook takes, he had to take with the rook guys. Okay, very important moment. What's wrong with bishop takes? Well, the answer is rather simple. You see how this is all pinned up rather badly? Rook f1, it's game over. You're gonna lose a piece or a queen. So he had to give up the exchange. But keep in mind, black has still two pawns and the bishop pair. The game is far from over. And here Smyslov makes another small inaccuracy. It looks like a very logical move. You block the pawn, you attack the b-pawn, but more accurate was queen d3 put an extra pressure, not allowing the king to run away. Now black has to waste a huge tempo, right? Maybe queen e7 protecting the bishop. And here you can even swing the queen over, guys, to b4. 
five using the pin and that pawn is a gunner. All right, so queen b4 maybe runs into mate. I mean, what other moves you have? b6, you can play rook takes, queen takes, rook d1. So I just don't see much way of surviving. I think he has to play king here, takes, and just kind of play this bad position. Anyway, Smyslow makes another inaccuracy, queen e4, king here, queen d5, bishop c6, queen takes b6, good play from black, queen a6, bishop back, queen c4, and here, guys, after queen c6, black is in serious trouble. He played really well defensive chess to survive this far, but going into the end game, well, white doesn't have to take, but basically, this is not the kind of move you want to play as black because the queen can later invade. The key move is e4, and he probably didn't like knight c3 because this pawn is weak. But you can just keep pushing that pawn, and now you see what the two bishops are doing. They're opening up the game. As a matter of fact, modern engines such as Stockfish 12 tell me that this position is roughly equal. But, of course, it's too complex, and either side can still lose. I prefer slightly white, but... I do respect the bishops in this position. So yeah, a few inaccuracies there, and black could have gotten back into the game. Instead, after queen c6, queen f7, I really like that move. Bishop has to go to a very ugly square. And now Smyslov, with a couple of checks, activates his, his pieces. He, he wins the bishop. Queen takes g2, but who cares? Extra rook is extra rook. Bishop e4, another little tactic, but simply... Queen c8. Yeah, white is more or less converting this one, guys. Rook here, check. Queen e8, another cool idea. You see how he's using the queen to create really nice mating nets. Bishop c6 is forced. And he probably should have resigned. Instead, the game continued for a couple more moves. And finally, on move 41, he called it a day. Well, what can I say about this game? Smyslov played with incredible creativity. Second, his pawns left and right, left and right, open up the enemy king. And then this g4 move, extremely creative way to get the rook involved. But I should also point out that his opponent, a lesser known player, Kuzminich, he actually played this a5 rook a6 idea quite cleverly, and he could have gotten close to full compensation, right guys? For the exchange with the two bishops and pawns, but he messed up with queen c6 and lost the game. So modern chess is very similar to this game. Both sides are being very creative when they're attacking and defending, and the side who plays the most accurate moves wins. But this is by far not modern game at all. 1951, very, very ancient game, yet it does teach us a lesson, guys. Study your classics. Thank you very much. This was Grandmaster Eugene Perlstein for ChessLecture.com. Goodbye.